Coming up this week on Headline Humboldt, we interview Humboldt County Film Commissioner Cassandra Heseltine about a new Star Wars themed festival coming to Humboldt County. The Forest Moon Festival will honor and celebrate the use of local redwood forests in the iconic Star Wars franchise. Also, a major milestone has been reached in the development of wind energy as a viable industry on the North Coast. A ribbon cutting was held for the new offices of Crowley, the company that will take an active leadership role in onshore efforts moving forward. Coming up now on Headline Humble. From the top of Humboldt Hill, this is Headline Humboldt. I'm James Falk. Thanks for joining us. Even back in 1983, when I first saw Return of the Jedi, I recognized that something about that lush green and forested moon of Endor struck me as eerily familiar. I would later learn, of course, that many of those scenes on Endor, where Ewoks and speeder bikes apparently reign supreme, were actually filmed in our region of Northern California. Those scenes are, of course, stunning cinematic gold, and they do a whole lot by themselves in advertising for all the world just how beautiful our area can be. Star Wars, for kids in my generation, was a rite of passage, a ready-made myth for understanding who and what we are and how we should be prepared to fight for what's right. Through the use of archetypal tropes and a grand narrative of conflict and resolution, the original trilogy reached deeper into our collective subconscious than perhaps any previous film we can name. It resonates even today. And as that universe now explodes on Disney Plus to include numerous movies, new spin-off series, and a wide array of other productions, it's certainly smart to remind the world where some of that original movie magic began in the hopes of attracting even more interest from Hollywood and beyond. This new Forest Moon Festival will do just that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. But first, we're going to go to a reporter, Ryan Hudson, who turned in a report this week to honor and reflect upon the death of Josiah Lawson six years ago. We're just watching people come back right now from the 5K run. Run, walk, row for justice. That's yes. right. Yes. And this is the six year memorial anniversary. So we've got a lot of supporters out here today. It's encouraging to keep going maybe? We have to keep going. You never give up. When we fight, you win, right? And you never give up on your loved ones. You keep fighting until that day come when justice is served. And I will never give up until I get justice for David Josiah Lawson, my DJ. My son should have been here now. He should have been here. He was viciously taken from us way too soon. And his killer is still walking free. And the community and everyone know who that killer is. Humboldt's new district attorney, Stacy Eads, could decide to prosecute the case, relying on the evidence currently available. The Lawson family met with Humboldt County's DA to talk about the possibility of a future indictment. Well, I met with Ms. Eads, um, myself, our supporters, along with um, Black Lives Matter LA, mm -hmm. and um, I actually arranged, I reached out to her and um, asked for this meeting, and she said yes, so I was grateful to her. Um, she did say that she is reviewing the case. Um, she should have an answer for us in about three months or so. So I'm looking forward to hearing from her within the three months period. I hope it's sooner than three months. Mm -hmm. um, I know we have enough evidence to bring this back to trial and get a, a standing uh, holding order <laughs> and hold Kyle Christopher Zoner responsible for the murder of my son. We have enough evidence. We have his um, bloody, saturated clothes. We have the DNA on the knife. His and my son, we have my son's um, DNA. Uh, we have Kyle Zona's DNA underneath my son's fingernail. We have countless of eyewitnesses um, shouting in the direction of Kyle Zona saying he did it, he did it. So we have more than enough evidence um, to hold him over and for him to answer to for the murder of my son, yes. So okay. we're, we're, we're praying that she sees what we see because the evidence is there and um, we just need to prosecute him now. She needs to charge him and prosecute him. We have way more than enough evidence um, to hold Calzona responsible. Um, in the pr when he sued the city of Arcata, he testified for a day and a half on the stand and he, they asked him, where did all that close, that blood came from? He said the blood came from him wiping his face. His clothes was saturated with blood. There is absolutely no way that all that blood came from just his beaten face after he stabbed my son. He was beaten up. And there's no way. There's blood on the back of his pants. 
there is blood um, on this, the front of his sweats pants, the blood soaked through from his black shirt to his white t-shirt. All that blood did not come from a beaten face. And Detective Dockweiler also stated that amount of blood came from someone that was involved in a, a butcher, a butcher um, uh, 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 situation where my son was bleeding out. So Kyle's owner is the responsible party for the murder of my son and he needs to be held accountable. And was Kyle's owner the only person seen and reported fighting with Josiah? The only person, the only person. A request for comment has not been answered by the DA's office as of the time of publishing. For Headline Humboldt, this is Ryan Hudson. Speaking of Arcata and its efforts to improve enforcement, City Hall is now upping the ante to hire more police officers. Wednesday, the City Council approved a $22,000 500 retention bonus to be paid out over three years. City officials hope the bonuses will disincentivize Arcata's current officers from seeking other jobs. For officers working elsewhere who join EPD, the council boosted the hiring bonus from $15,000 to $50,000. City officials say it costs $65,000 to send beginning recruits to the police academy and then train them. I have heard our community asking, even demanding at times, an increase in staffing in our police department. Some of those concerns include traffic safety, more of a presence in Valley West or a substation in Valley West, the plaza, um, encampments and other quality of life impacts, theft, broken windows. We funded um, an outreach sergeant position to help people in crisis. And that's Sergeant Luke Scown, who um, I understand is now back on patrol because of the low staffing. The department currently employs 19 officers. That's down a third from a peak in 2020. If recruitment succeeds, the city says it will restore its school resource ranger, park ranger, and officers dedicated to downtown and to Valley West. I'm here now with Cassandra Heseltine, the Humboldt County Film Commissioner, also Del Norte County, right? Correct. It's kind of a joint uh, project? It is, yes. Okay. We call it the Redwood Region. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the things that's, uh, I mean, the Forest Moon Festival, I grew up, um, as I said in the intro on Star Wars, it was kind of a uh, huge part of my life. I'll go ahead and say that. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, first off, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, I mean, we're not, I don't know how old you are, but we're of an age. So I would ask sure. you, what's your <laughs> Star Wars story? Do you have My one? Star Wars story. Well, you know, I do remember being, you know, those are boy movies, but I obviously I hear the music and I'll, I get nostalgic, sure, you yeah. know, and and now I do have a, a 19 year old in the house right now um, just for another month that mm -hmm. is definitely, you know, would call themselves a Star Wars nerd. Yeah, and yeah. Um, we we definitely got to experience you know, raising a child like that of, of somebody who was super into it, you know, so. Yeah, so you've, you've got that familial, uh, you know, connection with it, with your kids yes, and whatnot. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, describe for me what this, the Forest Moon Festival will look like for people who are able to make it. Sure. So the festival, which started off with a great uh, collaboration with City of Eureka and the Zeus Foundation last year, and um, we had always been working on this for about 10 years with an idea, you know, tried working on it in 2019, thinking, what is it? What's it going to be like? And then we ended up doing a baby version with them in uh, 2022, which was really great. And then this year being the 40th anniversary, we thought we got to kick off the wider version. Yeah. But what is that? And we realized we didn't want to rent like a fairgrounds and have booths. We wanted it to be bigger than that. We wanted to celebrate that it filmed both in Humboldt and Del Norte counties. Mm -hmm. And we thought that we would make it more like a holiday, if you will. So like yeah. 4th of July, where people, everybody wears t-shirts and dresses up and decorates. And then there's activities everywhere that are celebrating that. Well, we want the same thing. It's mm -hmm. like we've created a holiday yeah. uh, for the region. And mm -hmm. so we want everybody you know, wearing costumes. We want everybody decorating. We want businesses, restaurants, hotels, uh, all the businesses, you know, downtowns, everybody decorating. And then we want other activities on top of that. We ourselves are gonna be showing a screening in Garberville, uh, Eureka, Arcata, uh, and Crescent City. Okay, um, wow. And these are outdoor screenings. Um, so it'll be at the Mateel, well, two of them are outdoor, sorry. Two of them are indoor, one will be at the Mateel, Sequoia Park, Cal, with Cal That's Poly. That's the one to go to, I think. <laughs> uh, they're all gonna be pretty amazing. No, the Cal sure, Poly sure. is going to have um, a, panel afterwards and I can't say who's on the panel yet but I can tell you 
maybe somebody who actually helped make the movie is oh, on the panel. Cool. So yeah, that one's awesome. going to be pretty cool, yeah, yeah. too. Thanks to our sponsors that help are helping make each one of these screenings happen. And then we have the beachfront one uh, as well up in Crescent City, which is going to be amazing. It kind of kicks it off Friday night. Yeah. So there's activities that are going to be happening throughout with that. And then we have other activities, like Crescent City is going to be doing a Jedi training course. Sequoia is going to do a Jedi training course with okay. the city of Eureka. Um, the zoo is going to be doing an amazing thing again. I know that there's a and dance. And the skywalk is also can f sort of fit into this. It's, like, yeah, yeah it's almost like as if you're in a Ewok village. So yeah, there's yeah. things everywhere. We're getting the schedule up, and um, we just ask everyone be patient with us because we're creating while we're executing at the same time. Sure. We finally got permission to do this in January from Lucasfilm, and so we've had four months to basically create and execute. Can um, I ask you how that yeah. was? I mean, dealing with the uh, you know the, the huge beast that is Lucasfilm, right, I mean, right. were they easy to work with or were they so you know hard what? to get this permission? They're, they're fabulous. They're very busy. So, sure, you yeah, know, yeah. at one point I did offer my child, my adult child, as, who's a good cook. I'm like, do you want her to come and make you food? What do I need to do here? And they're like, no, no, we have enough, you know, of our own kids. Um, so, it, it, but that once I did get a hold of them and they were able to look at everything, they said, this is great. This is fantastic. Have at it. Just, you know, make sure you do the rules. That, um, that doesn't step on their IP. And we have to mm -hmm. kind of think about that, that yes. would we want someone to take our ideas and go make money off of that? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's like you've got to capture enough of it to make it belong, but not take ownership right. of it or whatever. Right, right? and yeah. there's a couple different rules and there's different versions depending on if you're charging or not charging. All mm -hmm. of that is on our website, forestmoonfestival.org. Okay. It explains it all thoroughly. People can reach out to us if they need more help. But uh, yes, we're inviting everybody to from you know, decorating their business, to creating an event, mm -hmm. to, you know, having a pop-up, depending on all the different versions of what you qualify for and how you want to do it. And it explains how you can do all of that safely. Um, so on the, that- On the website. Yes, it does, And yeah. the dates that we're talking about here, can you be specific First on this? First weekend June? of June, so June 2nd and 3rd. We wanted okay. to be able to include things like Arts Alive, you know, which is, falls on the first week in Eureka. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we wanted Farmer's Market and Arcata, things like that. So we got, we're doing it Friday and Saturday um, this year. We'll probably expand to three years next year. Okay, awesome. That sounds amazing and exciting. Yes, um, and we have a great team too. We have uh, Tiffany Miller Designs is also helping produce this, which her and her team are experienced um, producers and director in Hollywood who are now in the region, and so um, we're really lucky to have them. Yeah, now so I was gonna talk a little bit about your job also and sort of how all this fits in. Um, I mean, basically your job is to encourage and support the film industry coming up here mm -hmm. and using Humboldt County as a, uh, a set for their car commercials, their movies, whatever you can get up here, right? Correct, yes, yeah. So we market the area to the film world. Yeah. We help them when they're on the ground, and then we focus on film tourism when they leave. Now, so, you know, it doesn't get any bigger, bigger than Return of the Jedi. So does that help you, do you think, in terms of marketing us to other people? You know, like, you remember those scenes? The speeder bikes and Return of the Jedi, that's what you can get, you know, on a road tour in Humboldt County. Is that kind of working to your it, pitch? It does. We often say, um, what has filmed here? You know, in the past, you know, you know, indie films like to know and they want to be able to, like, look at that. Studio films want to know. Car commercials, all of that. They kind of want to know, uh, you know, what are your special features? Who's filmed there already? Who's had easy access? How, what was their experience? So it gives us some validity mm -hmm. when it comes to filming. The the only thing is sometimes it can be a deterrent, except for it ended up working in our favor. So for instance, with A Wrinkle in Time, Avery DuVernay and, and the yeah, Disney yeah. folks were like, oh, I know you've already had Return of the Jedi there. You know, it's so epic that w we won't stand a chance filming there. You've uh, already done that. Uh. And I said, okay. And we were looking at other different types of trees, which I'm like, if you're gonna come here, why aren't we looking at redwoods? Yeah. So I said, well, we have time, we're ahead of schedule. Do you mind if we just go on this lane right here and just look at the redwoods? Could I just show you the red? I mean, you yeah. can't come here and yeah, not yeah, look at the redwoods. redwoods right? <laughs> so I showed them the redwoods and you know, 15 minutes later, the schedule changed and of course they filmed in the redwoods. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's yeah. hard to beat the grandiosity. And obviously. I think that everybody realizes eventually that it's gonna look different, it's their project. There's enough redwoods to share the love amongst all productions. So. Yeah, not all redwood forests look alike. And, no, and they don't. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, they're very different. So now how, I mean, we've, we're recently coming out of COVID and I know that, uh, I mean, you've been working on this project to sort of raise our, uh, you know, I don't know how you'd call it, uh, raise our profile in mm -hmm. the business. Mm -hmm. How's that going? I mean, did COVID push, push us back? Are we where we were at prior to COVID? Are we booming in busters into the future? Where yeah, does that stand? Actually, we were we actually did really well during COVID, surprisingly enough. We had an Apple movie that was already interested in coming to us. 
um, A24 slash Apple movie that was already w wanting to come prior to the pandemic. And so uh, we ended up having that film and a handful of other smaller things. So we did very well uh, during the pandemic. And then coming okay. out of it, we were continuing to do well. Normally when there's some type of problem in the world um, or the rest of the, you know, a larger outside of California, a lot of filming then stays close to home and stays in California. And we were kind of anticipating our numbers would get bigger. Um, and they started to do that. But the one thing that did hurt us is not that is now we are going into a writer strike. And so That's right. the writer strike yeah. is actually what's hurting everybody right now. And the streaming platforms having to decide what they're going to do. Like Netflix is now going to be charging for your IP address at your one house. You can share amongst your family, but you can't share with like another friend or family at another house. So yeah. there's things that they're having to figure out and that changes w how much content they're creating um, and purchasing and then how much filming they're gonna be doing. So things that are really outside of our hands are happening, which is why we're focusing on the festival now too. We still have filming. We currently have sure. a couple of projects here right now in town. Yeah but it's just not at the same level that we would have liked to have seen. So we thought, well, let's switch a little bit and focus on our, our third focus, which is the film tourism. Now, so with the writer strike, I mean, basically production would cease or planning for productions would cease at, up to a certain point. There is, because right, anything that involves writers, you yeah, know, yeah. so that's like, what was it? You don't have it? product to produce if you don't have. Right, in the early 2000s when there was a massive writer strike, huge. that's when reality TV came out yeah, because Survivor, they Survivor, or not Survivor, but uh, Lost, shut down, had a season, I mean, it's right. terrible. I yeah. <laughs> and, and a lot of it has to do with they, they don't need, you know, if you don't need the writer, like if that's when they realize reality TV doesn't need a writer. Exactly. We right, can, right? So that's when that boomed. Ah. Um, so probably, whether you like that or not, we might get more uh, reality TV, those kind of shows, yeah. commercials. We'll still get things. We just won't get the narrative content that we normally like to have and be part of. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's like you'd think that the job wouldn't have changed that much, but you mentioned that like, we are in a world now where there is so much content being produced by online providers like Netflix and Hulu and, and all those sorts of things. I mean, I imagine you spend a lot more time sort of trying to, you know, keep pace with what they're doing and what they're looking for rather than just pitching to studios, right? That's not right. really what you do anymore. I'm yeah, sure. no, I mean, I've done some meet and greets where you go down and you pitch to a studio and you say, hey, keep us in mind. Yeah. But a lot of what we do is instead of to the ex studio execs, it's really the location manager. Managers, that okay. is really who is the person that's in charge of I even scouting and exploring. So they learn from the production designer, the director, the producers, what is it that you're looking for? What do you see in your mind's eye when you read the script? And then they put on their creative hat and then they go look for that location. Then when they're looking for that location, then they're also going to figure out logistics. You know, they're going to see, is it, uh, you know, close enough to a base camp to have my whole crew come there, but look like we were far deep in the woods, but we really are in a parking lot, you know? Yeah. Um, is it feasible as far as having hotel stays and we can bring in caterers and can we get talent there and all of those things. So they have two hats they have to wear. They have to be sure. creative to tell the story that all but the- pragmatic. Yeah, the but yeah, yeah, they have to know, is it really film friendly? Yeah. And that's what I've worked hard on is really getting our area film friendly, you know, and understanding, you know, what does it mean to be part of the productions and, and to help out with that? Yeah, absolutely. It's fascinating work that you do. I mean, would you, um, we've had several movies here that have been big names before. We talked about Return of the Jedi, but then also mm -hmm. there was Outbreak and there was uh, The Majestic. Mm -hmm. And I, each one of those has their own, you know, list of stories that goes along with it. The Majestic was disruptive for the town of Ferndale. Sure. And there were some issues there. Do you feel like we're learning from each of these projects and, to, and how to become a better host county? Or is it something that it kind of just depends on what the personalities are of each individual project? Well, I think both can be true, right? Yeah. You know, you're always going to get something unique and different about a project and what they want maybe that we hadn't anticipated or have ever been asked about before. Uh, you know, but I think one of the things was that, you know, I came in as somebody who was a producer of 12 years, you know, I'd done three feature films and an episodic television show. So I knew what I needed when I went, especially my television sure. show was uh, on location. Which I show was that, if you don't mind me asking? It's called Hacienda Heights. It didn't do okay. great. <laughs> no, but it was there. But it was enough. It, it, it taught me a lot. It, you know, it was yeah. on the Bay Area. It played, you know, up and down in the Bay Area and then inland. And, yeah. uh, you know, and it, was, and it was a great experience. And actually a whole bunch of people in that went on to go do bigger shows. So, you know, it- Those are connections for you too, right? Yeah, and but hopefully. also it's the model that we're kind of using right now, even with the Forest Moon Festival, because this feels more like an episodic television show that we're producing than yeah. a festival, you know? But it's, so it's very helpful. But- it, um, you know, as far as becoming, you know, film friendly, you know, realizing taking that that experience that I had, you know, and when I did take this job, 
experiencing like calling hotels and saying, hey, would you like to be on our website as a resource, you know, for productions? And nobody knew who the film commissioner was. Mm -hmm. I kept getting, what are you, the phone commissioner? And <laughs> I Googled it. I was like, there is no such thing as a phone commissioner, yeah, yeah. you know? And I went, well, what's going on, you know? And it's more than me just not enunciating, you know? There was yeah. something else going on there that people really hadn't heard. We were lucky at that point, you know, 12 years ago, if we were, had one article in the Times Standard, you know, a year. Yeah, yeah. Granted, this is, you know, as uh, social media is taking off, but we were able then to go, you know, what? Our, our audience isn't just productions for us to be marketing to. We need to market to our home here as well so Absolutely. that everybody understands what it means to be film friendly. So uh, I think that taking that knowledge that I had, um, educating the community, and then everybody embraced it and they're doing amazing. So when we do get these requests, we are able to, you know, be a little bit more up to par of what they need. Yeah, what would you say, I mean, we have about a minute and a half left. What would you say is the number one selling point for Humboldt County as a place to come and film? Well, it's the Redwoods. Of course, right? <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, I you know, it's the easy. beauty. I think that what one of my favorite things is, I remember my first walk, which I can't tell you how many years ago that was, uh, <laughs> when I came to come to what is now known as Cal Poly Humboldt, but at the time was HSU uh, as a freshman, 18 years old. And I went out in the forest in white jeans, you know, mm. I'm sure you can imagine how that <laughs> ended up. Never wore white jeans again. And But seeing the trees for the first time just blows your mind if yeah, you've never been in absolutely. anything like that epic. And so every time I take a production out, I always go, oh yeah, they haven't seen trees yet, this'll be fun. And then I live it through them. I mean, I, I feel like I'm gonna get verklempt, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Talk no, amongst yourselves, absolutely, you know? Like, yeah. It's really, you know, it's overwhelming to like go, oh my gosh, the beauty of what we have here, the coastal, you know, the coastline, uh, the Victorian villages, the architecture, you know, the quirkiness, the weirdness, you know, mm -hmm. all of those things of our area, um, it's just really neat. And then people love, on top of that, we really make sure to include uh, you know, other amenities like Humble Me products in a gift basket for them. Sure. So they experience our art and our culture. Yeah. You know, we take them out to the restaurants that we have. They experience our farmer's markets and just really see how, how you know, really cool we are here. And yeah. they will often, you know, I've had even Ava DuVernay say, you know, what's real estate like, you know, and, <laughs> and you know, seriously, and yeah. has looked into purchasing maybe a house here, you know, yeah, so yeah. they really feel the vibe of the whole thing. It's not just our locations, and it's but not it starts just, with that. Yeah, it starts with that, but it also sells our whole community. It, it like. really, really yeah. does, yeah. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming down. Thanks it for was having me. We, a little hectic getting started, but we yeah. got it going, so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back after this short break. Hi, I'm Tracy Barnes Priestley, and I want you to join me on season three of What's on Your Bucket List. Are you excited to learn a new skill or curious to explore something you've only dreamed about? This show is for you. If you are at least 60 years old, please join me for an experience you won't forget right here in Humboldt County. To apply, go to keat.org or call 707-497-5052. Now, What's on your bucket list? Friends and supporters of Keat TV, we are calling all who have a passion for public television on the North Coast. Keat is looking for a diverse group of people to join its Community Advisory Board, or CAB. CAB members play an advising role to management and act as Keat's ambassadors within the community. Meetings are held quarterly on Zoom. Go to keat.org, find the link for CAB, and get involved today. We look forward to meeting you. Humboldt's offshore wind industry celebrated a milestone at the Warfinger Building Wednesday. Crowley, the company that will manage the onshore component of offshore wind on the Samoa Peninsula, opened offices in Eureka. Its responsibilities will include converting Redwood Marine Terminal 1 into a heavy lift terminal capable of assembling the more than 800 foot tall turbines. We often talk about how much we need a new industry or a new set of industries to help diversify our economy. Just our state alone has set targets that are four to five times what the current leased projects at full capacity will be able to produce. So we really are gonna need a lot of energy um, through offshore wind. And I think you know Humble is poised to be a key player in that. This terminal is not only going to support Eureka and the community of Humboldt, but all of the state of California and the U.S. West Coast. 
within the next couple of months, we're going to release the environmental impact report for this new terminal project and really start the public participation project so that we can work towards getting our permits in 2024, next year, to build the, this new terminal. We have a strong maritime history, but we need to build up our longshoremen, our tugboat operators, our bar pilots. And Crowley is the leader in the field operating and constructing maritime terminals, bringing this supply chain to our region, the marine transportation systems. Next month in Scotia, the county will host a networking event for international companies hoping to participate in offshore wind supply chain. As part of a grant project with WETA's new series, Iconic America, we spoke to Assistant Professor Valerie Elder from College of the Redwoods to explain the economic and cultural value of redwood trees. Hi, my name is Maddie. I'm a professor here at College of the Redwoods in our Forestry and Natural Resources Department. I have the opportunity to teach dendrology, which is the study of all of our woody plant species and working to identify those, um, so our trees and our shrubs. In addition to teaching Intro to Wildland Fire, all of our GIS classes, Forest Health and Protection, as well as a Tech and Applications class. Um, on a great day, and as many days as I can fit into the semester, we spend it outside enjoying enjoying these amazing redwoods and all of the communities that are found amongst them. Awesome, so let me show you a little bit about my favorite part of the redwoods. Uh, first things first, let's talk about their bark. So this right here is actually a member of our cypress family. So redwoods are more closely related to cypresses than they actually are our pine species. So you'll notice that this bark has got this beautiful red color. It's fibrous in nature quite stringy um, and this is due to those tannins that actually the bark is composed of which helps to uh, fight against diseases and also insect outbreaks it's really amazing these trees can actually form quite a protective layer of bark the redwoods bring such an amazing sense of peace i love walking beneath them and uh, just hanging out in their own little microclimate and having the ability to uh, feel how moist it is all around, see that lush green foliage. These trees have been here for so long, they can live on average anywhere from 500 to 700 years, but at times can even live past 2,000 years. So when I walk out into the forest, I think about that, I think about how much they've actually been able to see and the history that these guys have been a part of. You can watch Iconic America, our symbols and stories, right here on Keat TV, Wednesday, April 26th at 10 p.m. You know, it's one of those synchronicities that redwood trees were just like the subject of the show this weekend, and it's, and it's a fine subject. I mean, trees are awesome. That's it for now. Have a great weekend. Stay tuned. Stay informed.